this, this seminar um, under the auspices of Sustainable Lifestyles Research Group. This is a very apposite um, topic for us because in, in the SMRG programme we're doing a lot of work on the theory of life stage transitions, the, the idea that moments of changing people's lifestyles might open them up to greater readiness of willingness to adopt new, new, new practices, behaviours and values in relation to sustainable living. So that particular thing which we're just going to talk about is especially relevant for us. So it's a great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Justin Spinney, former colleague of ours, of course, on the Resolve Programme, who's now at the Sustainable Mobilities Research Group at the University of East London. Very, very much what you've got to say, Justin. You'll be speaking for about 40 minutes, gives us 20 minutes or so for discussion. So please, you're very welcome to speak. Welcome yeah. back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for taking up your lunch hour uh, today. So, as Ian said, oh, uh, how, do you, how do you get rid of this, Gemma? Escape, that's okay, it. Right. So, yeah, um, I'll be talking today on a, on a, about a project that I'm involved in um, at East London University, looking at um, the experiences of first time parents in terms of their travel. Um, it is a work in progress, I have to say. I'm still in the second stage of field work, so um, I don't think you know my, my sort of conclusions are going to be anything groundbreaking, but one of the reasons to be here today is, is to get some feedback and some comments from, from everyone, really, um, uh, on what looks uh, convincing or interesting so far. Um, before I talk about that, just for there's probably a few people who don't know um, where I come from. I'm a cultural geographer by training. Um, and um, I did a PhD in urban cycling at, at Royal Holloway. And then after that, I was a research fellow here um, working on the Resolve uh, project. And in that, I was actually looking at constructions of sort of consumer demand, um, trying to, to sort of get behind these ideas of consumer sovereignty in the individual consumer. Uh, and that's really where, where the kind of social practice approach that I've taken to this project has, has kind of come from. Um, so as I say, I'm now working uh, at UEL and the Sustainable um, Abilities Research Group. Um, so in terms of what I'm going to say today, just quickly, I'm going to talk a little bit about what sustainable mobility, sustainable transport actually is. Then I'm just going to talk a little bit about the theory behind this um, uh, this particular project and methods and sampling. Then a little bit on analysis in terms of these four themes that are kind of coming out of the data and then briefly conclusions. So before I launch into that though, um, it's probably useful to ask what is sustainable transport, what is sustainable mobility. So does anyone want to hazard a guess what what is sustainable mobility anyway? Non-motorised. <laughs> non Non-motorised. Non right, okay. Anyone else? Local. Local. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure if they're on my list. <laughs> I'm not sure if they're on my list. This is my list. So, quite a few things, as you can see. Meets basic needs, affordable and efficient, lots of things. Now, the ones that I've sort of highlighted there are the ones that the talk I'm giving today speaks to a little bit more, I think. A lot of them are obviously to do with environment in terms of limiting emissions, minimising consumption. There's very much a social aspect as well to sustainable mobility in terms of a system that is affordable, efficient and offers choice and respects human health and well-being. Um, and it's also, and I don't think it's on that list, I think fundamentally it's about participation in decision-making processes and I, I think that doesn't actually make it onto a lot of lists. Um, I won't really be talking about that today. So, <laughs> so, in terms of why we might need more sustainable transport, I doubt anyone in this room is in the dark on that. Um, we've known for a long time, particularly about the local effects of our transportation, ever since uh, really um, the 60s with uh, Buchanan's traffic in towns. That highlighted a lot of issues around severance, about noise, air, light pollution. These, these kinds of issues, so we've known very much about local uh, based issues, but it's only in the last 20 or 30 years that we've really um, come to grips with some of the wider wider um, sort of implications uh, of the way we move around in terms of CO2 emissions, acidification, use of renewables, all these kinds of issues really, um, and of course um, 
3,000 odd deaths per year um, in the UK alone. Uh, and we've got rising levels of obesity as well, of course. So, and what, one of the other things which is just slowly making it in its way into transport planning is awareness of the kind of social and distributional effects that some people benefit from transport, uh, from the positive effects of transport much more um, than the harmful effects of transport, if you will. So, in terms of how we might go about achieving sustainable mobility, well, it will come up at once. There's lots of different things we could do, and it depends where, where our focus is, really. Is our focus at the more local level, is it across a variety of scales? But I've just chosen to focus on those four there briefly. First, we could reduce the need for travel. Yep, but the layout of our towns and cities has evolved with cars. Um, lots of essential facilities are not within a short distance of where people live, and so that's a very difficult thing to do. We're also having much more globalised lives now. People are travelling much, much further distances just to keep social networks, family relationships going. Um, and so it makes reducing the need for travel um, a difficult proposition in many respects, um, particularly in the West. Um, now, here yeah, we can improve public transport. Um, we've got In London, we've got the Barclays Bike Hire Scheme. Quite contentious, I would say. Um, We've got the overground, we've got a number of, of, of things there, but they still rely on people perceiving those public transport systems as more appealing than less sustainable modes, and that's one of the key things I will be talking about today. Um, we can attempt, attempt to tax people uh, away from sustainable modes, but, you know, congestion charging, fuel duty, things like that. I say that's not particularly democratic, as the rich are going to be flying and driving well after the poor um, are not going anywhere. So, um, not my favourite. Um, and then, finally, we can look at ideas of behaviour change. And this is relatively recent in, in, in some ways. The idea that we can change people's attitudes and behaviour towards travel and encourage them to use more sustainable modes. Um, and this is currently popular, um, particularly in policy circles in DEFRA and DEC because they're, you know, they're seen as less contentious than regulating um, uh, people's behaviour in stricter ways. They have, however, met with limited success. And that is where, is that the top of my next slide? Possibly. That's where this project really comes in. And a lot of it was, was a dissatisfaction with ideas about individual behaviour change that sort of came from my last piece of research here at Resolve. So, um, this idea that um, you can just sort of, you know, with social marketing and advertising and labelling initiatives, that you can sort of persuade individuals to adopt a greener lifestyle. Um, th this idea that attitudes motivate behaviour. Um, in reality, I would say that um, values don't always translate in into, into um, actions and, and behaviour um, because sort of many environmentally significant practices are routinised, they're ingrained, they're unconscious, they're the, the everyday level and not particularly questioned. And as um, Elizabeth Shove has demonstrated, things like heating, lighting, washing and travelling, people reproduce expectations that aren't theirs alone. Um, and such ways of behaving are often shaped by the homes in which we live, uh, the streets in which we travel and the things that we own. So to clarify, social practice theory still, it still f has a focus on norms and normative assumptions, but it's concerned with how they arise out of practices. Um, and Shove suggests, for example, that an escalation in, in one social practice, such as requiring more, more equipment to do something, may well require a new form or escalation of mobility in order to accommodate it. Um, and she's used in, in, in what is, you know, well, now, I'm not so sure seminal as the word, but quite a, a well-known book, Comfort, Cleanliness and Convenience. It uses the example of comfort in relation to um, heating to demonstrate that standards of what constitutes a comfortable domestic temperature have risen gradually over the years, and that has an implication, um, a corresponding rise in domestic energy use. So if we look at that in terms of people's travel and people's mobility, it follows that the formation of travel patterns is far from straightforward. Um, the, the extent of mode dependency is not just the result of a given transport system, um, 
It's also the result of other practices that have evolved alongside. And so with changing lifestyles come new modes and patterns of mobility. Um, I just realised I forgot to go through those. Um, and so coming down there to the bottom, in terms of the importance of material culture in this, um, um, the kind of the stuff and the competencies associated with social practices are seen to constitute a form of a sort of lock-in really, which favours particular forms uh, and patterns of mobility. And so in doing so, social practice theory also challenges the idea that decisions are made by rational individuals uh, who are free to change their behaviours and unconstrained by the realities of everyday life. So that's quite a crude run-through, um, uh, definitely, of, of, of you know, social practice theory, quite a partial reading of it. But, but it, it's kind of what, what informs this particular project. And so in order to focus on, on a point in life when a whole new set of practices is being imposed and learned and explore the ways in which quite habitual and value-laden travel choices are challenged, reproduced and escalated, in this project we've chose to focus on the experience of new parents. So in terms of what we've actually done, um, we uh, have a sample of 20 households in London, 10 of them in Newham, which is North East London, uh, no sorry, uh, East London, and 10 in Hackney, which is North East London. Um, and these were recruited through um, NHS antenatal classes and National Childbirth Trust antenatal classes. Um, just to try and get uh, a range of socio-economic backgrounds and, and the like. So we've got a range of family types, single and dual parent, uh, different cultural backgrounds and income quintiles. So just to demonstrate that, you can see, yeah, um, that's our 20 households and that's the distribution by income quintile. So a reasonable, a reasonable distribution. Um, and then also looking at country of birth, um, for a random sample, it's not, not a bad um, representation of London. Obviously, there's a few nationalities missing, but it's not bad. Um, so you just get to, you know, you get to see just the diversity of cultural backgrounds. <coughs> that we're, that we're kind of, Justin. Sorry. Um, is that of the, um, the woman who's having a baby? Is that her background? Or her yeah, that is, that's, that's based on the mother's nationality. I haven't put in. Was there. Um, so yeah, if I added that in, actually, it would be, you could probably put a few more countries in. <laughs> um, so yeah, and in terms of sort of how we, we've kind of um, done field work, we've got, the first phase of field work was from uh, April to June uh, last year, and so we've used three complementary methods, in-depth interviews, travel diaries, and social network tracking. So um, the first thing <coughs> is we've done an interview uh, and a social network, just to, uh, asking, literally asking participants about the places that they go, the people they visit, the things that they do, and just trying to get them to map this out so we get an idea. Um, and then just to add a bit of depth to that with the travel diaries, really just trying to get people to reflect on their experiences of their journeys. Um, and they've kept the travel diaries for two weeks. Um, and then we come back again now. Um, so that was three months prior to the due date, that first set of field work, um, give or take uh, a week or two. And now we've come back uh, six to eight months after the birth um, of their child. And so, as you can see, I'm still kind of in the middle of that one at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, I've got about half the diaries back and I'm nearly halfway through the um, second lot of interviews there. Um, So, as I say, analysis, I'm still in the middle of, of, of this at the moment, but there's certain things coming out. So I want to talk quite broadly first to give an idea of the general shifts that occur, uh, that we're seeing occur prior to and during, the, uh, prior to and uh, after the birth of the child. So firstly, prior to the birth of the child, the social networks of parents, you could kind of crudely characterise them around three things really. Personal fulfilment, which is like leisure and socialising, going to church, um, these kind of things. Social reproduction in terms of shopping, um, uh, and sort of, not social reproduction, sort of household uh, reproduction, shopping, um, banking, all, all these kind of things, doctors. Um, and then in terms of maintaining networks, um, just keeping in touch with friends and family, uh, really. 
And there was a distinct difference in the amount of mobility that immigrant and ethnic minority participants had. Most of them, if you look at their maps, they had very localised networks, just within a few miles of where they lived. And then, it was like a donut in some ways. There was, there was nothing really at the regional and national level until you then get to the international level, where they had links back to their home country. Um, and they were generally serviced by Skype, Facebook, phone, and the occasional visit. Sort of each year or two, really. And that was in quite contrast to people who were born in the UK and their families were in the UK who had very much filled up the scales. They had a more vibrant, um, uh, sort of, and widespread network in London, which took in m much more of London. Um, and then they also had a regional level with lots of a family, national level. They often went on breaks uh, within the UK. And then they also had a national level, which was much more to do with holiday, really, and occasionally with um, family. So there was a distinct difference there. Um, and I don't mean to alarm anyone, but after the birth of the child uh, and having become parents, the trend is for the personal fulfillment part of the network to pretty much disappear um, for mothers uh, and to a lesser extent for, for fathers. And it, this very much reflects the gendered nature of parenting in these cases. In all of these cases, um, the mother, in all 20, was the one to stay at home, look after the child. And where there was a father, um, well, there was all the father, obviously, but where there was a partner, <laughs> they, were, um, they were the ones going out and doing paid work. Um, and I'm sure this, you know, this is constantly changing. This is a snapshot at six, six to eight months, and already some mums are starting to go back to, to paid work. So this is, this is uh, a picture of flux. Um, but it certainly it reflects the gendered nature of parenting in these particular cases. Um, and then there was also a kind of socio-economic difference in the extent to which personal fulfilment is replaced by a focus on the baby as well. Um, many of the mums on higher incomes had replaced this with a very busy routine which was geared towards taking their baby to singing classes, to gym classes, to baby groups, to seeing friends with babies and, and very much in line with notions of intensive parenting which I'll talk a little bit about, about, about later. Whereas those on lower incomes tended to do less of these activities, particularly sort of, um, they might go and see family and friends a, a bit, that, that network was still there for them, it just served a slightly different purpose. Um, but they didn't. They tended not to go to the school start or the baby gym and, and all these kind of things. Um, and they also tended to go out less altogether after the baby was born. Um, so what what sort of starts to emerge is this very differentiated picture of mothers becoming mobile and immobile for for for, for new reasons uh, and in different ways. So to move on, I want to talk a little bit about futures and expectations, and this is based on the the data that was collected antenatal, so prior to, to the birth. Um, and yes, yeah, so I want to focus on the expectations many, many parents had of how their mobility would change once they were parents. And so, just to give uh, flavour, the, the first conversation here was with Paola. Um, she has a partner, but she lives alone. And she um, is in the lowest income quintile. So again, in these conversations, I'm trying to highlight some of the more relevant bits. That's not to say the rest is irrelevant at all. Um, so this is just chatting about her, her having a car. So she says, no, I don't have a car. I say, is, is that a conscious decision not to have one? And she said, why? Well, it's, it's too expensive, you know, the insurance and everything. So if you could perhaps afford it more, would you get a car and use it more? And she says, yeah, I was planning like maybe in the future, now baby and everything, I was thinking to buy like, even if it's a cheaper car or whatever, but it is easier. And she goes on, it's easy to travel. I can see in the bus sometimes the driver don't stop because the buggy is open. The woman is waiting with the buggy open. And plus inside the bus is full. There's already two buggies there. So they don't stop and they start arguing. And I can see myself in a few months. Um, so I said, yeah, so kind of other people's experience. Um, and just think, I don't want that. She says, yeah, I look and say, oh my gosh, it's going to be me in the future. And most of them, they say, oh, you need to close the buggy, but the baby's sleeping. How's she going to carry the baby in the buggy clothes? And then, no, it's hard. I think if you have a car, it's easier to travel. So, Paola used the buses a lot. She had a very compact, probably, I think, the most compact social network I'd seen. It was literally her mum, her sisters, and where she worked. And they were all within two miles of where she lived, and she didn't really do much else. Um, she used the buses a lot to get around, though. 
And these are her observations of, of, of other mum's experiences that led her to the conclusion that it will be difficult to use public transport in a way that allows her to care for her baby. And I think that's evidenced by this idea of having to wake your baby up. If you're going to care for your baby properly, you should let them you know, do what they want to do. They should be allowed to sleep. Um, so it becomes quite sort of child-centred, child this, this sort of idea of care that comes through here. Um, and so this idea that the bus won't allow to articulate um, that, that, that level of care. So she has a preference for a car, despite the, the fact that she can't really afford it. Um, and of course the possibility of just getting stuck in traffic a lot. Now at the other end of the scale, um, Esther and Pierre are French expats, and they're definitely well into the highest income quintile, but they had a conversation right? they said, I think we are thinking, um, the only thing we're thinking of maybe is we're going to buy a car just for the baby. And he goes on to say that they've got a parking space where they live, which is quite a luxury in London. Um, um, so, yeah, he says, uh, we don't have a car at the moment, to park the car's not a big deal. And, and in terms of, yeah, it depends how many times, well, we feel that you know, taking, taking a very small baby is not ideal on public transport, because if it's dirty and it's very busy. So I said, well, why do you feel that you'd be better off with a baby in a car as opposed to anything else? So Esther replied, probably, you know, uh, noise and crowd and the fact that it's a little bit dirty. I mean, plus I think, plus in the rush hours, that people are not very respectful. Um, yeah, when it's us, we don't mind, we squeeze, but with a pram, it's not very convenient, it will take longer, um, you have to take the lift, you know, it's not the same as running down the stairs. And he said, he says, we had a car for two years, we never used it. Um, you know, maybe with a baby, we'll have to make some adjustment. There's certain trips we do right now, and you know, even if it's very busy in the tube, it's not a good experience. So, uh, and then they go on to talk about the possibility of not having cars, but using taxis instead, um, uh, if they have to. Um, talking about the expense of it. So, very differently, Esther and Pierre can easily afford a car, and they even have the luxury of a parking space. Yet they've decided that public transport is good enough in London that a car is not necessary. But, as this shows, ideas of caring for the baby, so wanting a clean, safe, environment to transport the baby, um, they start to surface here in, in their thinking around getting a car, or at least hiring cars in the form of, of, of taxis. And then finally, very briefly, Emma, who lives with her boyfriend, um, slightly different but some distinct similarities. Um, she says, if I'm honest, I'm slightly sort of nervous about using public transport in a regular way, even though she was a regular public transport user, all these people were. Um, with my baby and thinking about the logistics of it and how complicated it's going to be. And you know, the thought of having a car parked outside ready to go when I just want to get back to mum and dad's is really attractive. Um, now, Emma can't actually drive. So um, she started talking to me about how she was wanting to get driving lessons in readiness. And so she, she didn't think she'd managed to do it um, before the birth because it was only a few months away. Um, but it was definitely on our agenda. So I haven't gone back and interviewed her yet, but it's going to be interesting to see what's, what's kind of happened there. Um, but again, you know, it's the kind of inconvenience um, there of using public transport, which is raised as a concern um, in terms of, of how um, the car system becomes preferable to the public transport system. Now, the, the stories here have some of the hallmarks of what uh, Freund and Donald Pedersen call structural stories. Um, and uh, regarding how one should or shouldn't move around. And according to, to Frundadol Pedersen, these stories are what people use to justify their choices and decisions. And so we start to see here that a particular vision of the future, which implicates the car, is already articulated prior to the birth. So these ideas around safety and convenience and care and comfort for the unborn child are all articulated in these stories. And importantly, the public transport system is not seen as a place where these can be articulated as well as the car system. And also, the agency and, and, and choice of these soon-to-be parents become subordinate to the level of care that they deem appropriate for their unborn child. So in, 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 sort, of, in sort of articulating these statements about what the future will bring, these performances start to produce the car-dependent parent um, even before the birth in some ways. So to move on, we've already touched there on ideas of care and comfort, and I want to talk about that in relation to cycling. I, I, um, I've obviously done a reasonable amount of work on cycling, but I didn't sample intending 
you know, thinking I've got to get some cyclists in this sample. But Hackney being the cycling capital of London, nine out of ten mums were pretty regular cyclists there. Um, and again, you know, there was a very clear socio-economic and ethnic split there. None of the um, none of the ethnic minority mums even mentioned cycling as an option. Um, which, yeah, it's interesting in itself and something that I am kind of exploring there. But so leading on from that and these ideas of cycling, it, like um, in the narratives of many participants, there was this normative idea um, that some modes of mobility are more appropriate for pregnant mums um, and new parents because of issues around safety. Uh, and this was very evident in how they talked about cycling. Um, and they, they really noted how friends and family and sometimes health professionals were telling them that they shouldn't cycle uh, whilst pregnant, that it was inappropriate. So, for example, not Clara, and she said everyone was kind of, you know, doing the whole pregnancy police thing on me, kind of going, you really shouldn't be doing that. Are you sure? It's not pretty safe. Uh, you know, and the same way they say, well, you shouldn't eat chocolate and you shouldn't drink, they were like, you know, you shouldn't cycle. Everyone's been very, very overprotective about it. Um, so, so here kind of Clara talks about how her ideas as well about keeping healthy and keeping the baby healthy, because she was saying it's annoying me because it was very good exercise, it was making me feel good, keeping my energy levels up. That kind of autonomy for her as a mum is kind of starting to be taken away um, in many ways. So the idea that, that she chooses how she travels uh, being taken away. And she says, when I first went to the hospital, I saw a midwife who, um, uh, she was just the initial person that I met, and she was like, oh no, you shouldn't be on your bike, you should definitely stop that now. I think, yeah, she was um, just uh, two or three months pregnant then. Um, and then, similarly, Macy, she talks in a slightly confused story about how one of the things that she used to do, she'd sort of sometimes drive and then she'd get the train back, but now, no one would let me get on the train at night time. Everyone's really like, no, 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 you've got to get in the car, you have to get in the car. At the moment, that's what everyone's been doing to me. So, um, she talks about here how she ends up being driven around because people think it's no longer safe to, for her to be on the train at night. And again, this is not just about her, this is about um, her unborn child. So you can see from these accounts that even, even before the birth, these concerns about safety, often not from mums themselves, start to dictate how they travel around. And sometimes that entails changing how you travel. So, um, from the bike to the bus, as happened with Clara, or from the train to the car, as we may see. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, that kind of agency and autonomy of, of, of the mum starts to be um, stripped away and shaped by um, others increasingly. So now, I just want to talk a little bit about the stuff of parenting for the re remainder. Um, now, I, I mentioned this earlier in terms of how important this is to um, sort of social practice theory. Um, this idea that new practices often require, you know, new things, new competencies in order to do them. And parenting is a prime example um, of requiring stuff um, for a practice. So, yeah, let's have a quick quiz. Um, some of you are probably parents. Um, God forbid, though, if you were to become a parent, or you, or you are a parent, how many of you would think of a pram or a push chair? Was something you would have to have. Let's have a quick show of hands. Okay. Random pick. Why would you need a pram? Because um, my child has about six months and get a bit too heavy to put in the um, thing that you can Okay, sling. So, so did you did you have a pram right from the word go, or did you have a sling for a while? Um, I had both right. from the word go. Yeah. Because it's interesting, because um, the pram's been with us for about 250 years now. Um, but in this research, as I said, I've got 20 households, 20, 20 mums in particular that I'm speaking to, but only one, one mum in 20 said she'd made a conscious decision not to get a pram because she thought it would be a nightmare with public transport, and that's Mary, and I'll talk a little bit about her story later. Um, and as I say, um, I've got some of the second travel diaries through, but I um, haven't done too many second interviews. Um, but out of the five people I've re-interviewed now, only one has regular access to a car. So the rest of them and the rest of their diaries, um, there's a lot of public transport in there. And those diaries are, are very insightful in terms of their experiences of trying to use buses, trains and tubes with 
a pram. So just to give some some examples, this is Laura. She's um, so yeah, she was trying to move house as well, so doing some flat things. I carried the pram up steps to the station. No one offered to help. Journey took ten minutes. Feeling tired, it was cold. I wish I could get in the car. Tired, was very tired from all the viewings. Dreading the stairs at the end of the journey. I was really struggling getting the pram and everything down them. And near the bottom, the man helped me. I was very grateful. Very relieved to get home. And then to Marna, um, some clothes shopping with the baby on the bus. The first time I got on the bus with a push jet, I didn't like it, too squashy and packed, nowhere to sit. And then planned to go to the city shopping by feeding my baby, but changed my mind and didn't want to go in the train with the push jet, I was too scared. Um, took baby by car to the clinic, journey took 10 minutes. Could have taken the bus, but I didn't mind going on the bus with the buggy. Um, so you get a real sense, I think, in these diaries of of sort of the stress and how tiring it is getting public transport with a buggy. Um, another participant, uh, who was Abidemi, um, she talked in her second interview about how, how she often had to wait for two buses to go past before she could get on one with a buggy. Um, and both she and Laura talked about having arguments with the bus driver when they tried to get on in the middle of the bus so they didn't push past people, um, and sometimes the bus driver had just driven off. Um, and yeah, that, that, that happened to both of them. And they also, also talked about how they felt less independent because they were constantly relying on people to help them up and down stairs with their buggy. So again, um, their autonomy and taking away a different sense of independence anyway. Um, and as Tamana says there, sometimes it even stops her going out at all. So for, for other participants, um, they talked a lot about um, public transport um, in relation to the plan as well. And what's interesting in is their accounts is the notion that they were no longer free to travel at the times that they, that they wanted to. So here's three different accounts. It says, I was shattered by the time I got home, I travelled outside a busy time, so it would be less stressful for Esme and to guarantee a seat. Um, yeah, probably the best time to use the bus and train virtually at 11 o'clock. And then, so it's written, difficult on tube with buggy, manageable with two people, but it's put me off trying to do it by myself. So here, um, Mia, Helen and Sarah, all show how they timed their journeys, and, and Sarah suggests that public transport is something she will only try and negotiate when her husband is with her, and that limits the journey she can do to the times that he's not at work. Um, so if a sustainable transport, transport system is one that offers choice and flexibility, then this probably isn't it, because um, these mums are not free to choose fully when they travel. They must travel when they think they'll be able to get a seat or get help with the buggy, or that it just won't, it won't feel um, like an awful experience. Um, and so it's also evident from the diary data um, that the difficulty of travelling with a buggy on public transport actually changes how people get around. So um, it's written there, took the buggy and walked because it was easier than taking the bus. Um, and this was from Esther, the man who tried to take the bus, there were two bus chairs on board already, so I had to book a cab to take them to the nursery. Um, so, some of those changes in mobility, some people might theorise as possible, uh, as sort of uh, as a good development, as a positive development. That someone's walking, they're not changing, the, uh, not taking the bus. But if you don't have that choice, then that's probably not a positive development for you, um, from a personal point of view. Um, and there's a distinct similarity here, I think, in some of these stories between what Paula observed in her structural story, um, or so-called structural story, and what these women have experienced, suggesting that they're not. I'm not. I'm sure I'm happy with that term, structural stories, but, you know, because it suggests that it's it's they're, they're told to justify a particular course of action. I mean, these are very practical stories, which are actually direct action. Um, they're not just about justification. Um, so what I think is interesting is that this narrowing of choice that using the buggy in conjunction with the public transport system brings about actually pushes people in some ways towards the car system. And Paula, um, no, not Paula, um, Laura, in her when she said, I wish I could take the car. What's, what's quite interesting with Laura is, is you know, she's quite pro-environmental. She, she made um, uh, a, a conscious decision on environmental and cost grounds that you know, her and her partner, they wouldn't get a car. But her second interview, which I have done, she really talked a lot about that they were gonna get a car. So, so even if you've got those values there, they're not being translated in, into behaviors anymore because, because of your experiences. Um, <coughs> so, yeah, there's this idea that the poor design 
of buses makes them hard to access with a pram, and the poor accessibility of many train and tube stations makes them hard to access with a pram. And the experience of using the system is such that travelling at certain times becomes nigh impossible. Now, I'm certainly not about to stand here and argue that having a sling is the answer to anyone's problems, because, as you said, useful up to a certain amount of months, but it does highlight the fact that some of those problems go away, um, at least initially, if you if you have if you look at the sling as a as a, as a as a thing as a part of the practice of parenting in relation to the public transport system, the fact that it doesn't matter if there's two buggies on the bus because you can still get on the bus, um, and all those kinds of things, um, and that is not to justify the very poor design of public transport, which is the key there. But it does go some way to show how having a buggy means there's this normative idea that the buggy is essential starts to favour the car system over the public transport system because of the stress, the tiredness and the discomfort it causes. Um, now, I'm going to end briefly with um, Mary. Oh, let's go back slightly. Now, <clears throat> as I said, there was one, one mother in, in the sample who, who actively reflected that it's going to be a nightmare using public transport with a buggy. I'm not going to get one. Um, <clears throat> but even then, she had a fight on her hands. As she says here, you know, she says, we travel a lot by public transport. It looks obscene, those women on the tube and on the bus looking and stressed with push chairs. And I think, um, I'm just going to try and use a sling. But Greg's mum doesn't agree. And said, OK, we had an incident on the weekend because she came down to stay and bought a pram. And I was really cross because I'd said to her, we weren't going to use one. She said, oh, you'll find it very difficult. Um, and she puts this pram about the size of a Mini Cooper or something. Um, and I said, what, she'd literally gone out and bought it for you? Yeah, she bought it and seen it in the Northern Echo for £10. And went and bought it. And I was quite cross, and she was cross, because, you know, I don't... I, she said, I don't know what I'm in for. And so I said, is that languishing at home? She said, no, I sent it back up north. So not, not very popular. Um, and she says, I think it's probably the same with all new parents. You have your ideas, maybe they won't work, but they're still your ideas and they're what you want to do. She says, and taking a massive pram on the tube when we live by a tube station that doesn't have a lift or anything, taking the huge thing, she doesn't think it through. And I got cross because I got told, oh, you'll see, do you know what I mean? And so what, what, what's interesting there, again, is that, that idea that even having made a constant decision not to, to have a pram, that... She still ends up with the press that she has to send back. And, and um, <coughs> to follow up on that, I got this email. Greg received an email, for, uh, this was two weeks after the interview. She has bought us another £10 pram from the Northern Echo. She didn't tell me. Um, uh, yeah, I only know because I saw the email open with the subject line pram. Greg has gone out of pocket to buy how best to break it to me. And she spent her time crying with laughter. <laughs> So since then, Mary and Greg have had their baby, and I haven't done the follow-up interview yet, but I do have the second travel diary, and it has got a pram in it. <laughs> so something has happened to make a change of mind. Um, and again, it's just a couple of bits from Mary's travel diary. So it's feeling positive, but running late. Had to carry the baby down loads of stairs at Bethnal Green. So difficult on the bus, but a couple of people help me. So the things that she saw would come to pass have come to pass, in a sense. But... but what was interesting about her diary was that she and she had a sling as well and she tried you could see that she tried to use that for public transport journeys and she tried to use her buggy for, for walking journeys and I'm gonna follow that up with her but that that's one of the things that comes across in the diary. But she's also started to talk, I think her baby is yeah, eight months now and she's starting to talk how it's it's not become become practical as well. So um, what can we make of this? Conclusions, okay. Ideas around intensive parenting. Now, <clears throat> that term was originated, I think, if that is a uh, correct term, in 1996 by Hayes. And he used um, this term intensive parenting to describe, and I quote, a form of parenting that advises mothers to expend a tremendous amount of time, energy, and money in raising their children. And so intensive parenting is, this, is a child-centered um, and, and sort of time and emotionally intensive form of parenting. Um, so what's that got to do with mobility? Well, I, I'd say it's, it's evident that, that, that as a part of intensive parenting, so these ideas about care and comfort and safety are very important, and it, it would appear that these 
these what what is an appropriate level of care, comfort, and safety has gone up in line with ideas of intensive parenting. Um, uh, and so to articulate those and to satisfy those increasingly requires the car. The public transport system doesn't, doesn't allow that and it's increasingly constructed as, as a sort of in opposition, as lacking um, and, and not allowing to articulate those particular values. Um, <clears throat> we could also say that, um, as Bailey has noted, that lives, lives are very much linked and that the, the kind of so-called choices that we make um, <clears throat> that are seemingly personal, but are often taken in relation to, to other people whose lives are very much connected to our own. Um, and to quote Walshman, they are, in other words, relational achievements rather than individual choices. Um, and I'll also just emphasise again the role of stuff, and particularly, you know, in this case, the buggy. The, the, the pram was not something I'd, I'd really thought oh, I'm going to focus on. It's this the theme that's really jumped out of the diaries. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the pram's been with us since well before the car and the rail age. Um, but, but increasingly, we've got a public transport system that doesn't accommodate that particular hybrid of mum and pram particularly well, um, and doesn't allow, as I say, the articulation of particular values. Um, so I, mean, what, I think what, what interests me then, what I'm getting at, is, is that to look at something as mundane as the pram in relation to these wider mobility <coughs> systems, I mean, it might appear uh, to have no bearing on creating a more sustainable transport system, but I think it shows how these are normative ideas around safety and stuff, um, that the safety and stuff required to, to be a parent push people away from things like using public transport and increasingly towards the car system. Um, so, yeah, I'll probably leave it there. They're quite tentative to conclusions, but they're always going to be, I think, at this stage, so my apologies for that. Thank you. Justin, thanks very much indeed. It's fascinating. I it's going to be very important, I think, to bring that work into dialogue with what we're doing on the, the illicit project and the habit project in SLRG, where we're looking at moments of change with people having their first child, people retiring, people moving house. So there's a bit of it's great potential um, interaction to be explored there, I think. We've got about a quarter of an hour. We'll, we'll, we'll go over a little bit past two o'clock because we, we started slightly late. So comments, questions, please. Just a little point um, that I, I, I want to make was that you um, presented that, that previously they had fulfilment activities, probably what you called it, and then they had their baby and the fulfilment activities disappeared and now they focused on their baby. And of course, the baby is a very great fulfilment activity and it's just a change of where you focus your fulfilment. So it's not that their fulfilment went away at all, <coughs> it's just placed no, no, in a different area. Yeah. I just think it's important not to... No, absolutely, and to, to nuance that, you know, a lot of people who would do shopping for themselves, they still do shopping, but now it's for their child. Um, I mean, there, there was definitely that. Um, it was it was more that sense that, that sort of leisure activities in, in in the same sense. So yeah, you're right. Maybe there is, it's more of a, a transition. But but none of so far people haven't described those activities when you when we're doing the maps. They haven't described them uh, in the same ways that they did with those previous leisure and and sort of. Um, yeah, leisure activities really. They, they describe them quite different differently. So yes, then there is no perhaps no doubt personal fulfilment there. But yeah, so in terms of how that gets classified, you're right. Yeah. And, um, and one other li little issue is that I think one thing with public transport is that all the problems of public transport are very visible to everybody. But um, also, if you're taking a child by car, I've actually done some similar research, but not fo focusing on a broader spectrum. And um, there are all kinds of issues of having to wake the child up to put it in a car, yeah. wake it up to take it out of a car, and actually yeah. it's really great to just have it in the pram, and then it goes to sleep, and then it sleeps all through your time in the coffee yeah. shop. You know, so, so it's you know, sort of careful. And I, I also think there's a bit of a thing where, where people, I think public transport's got a lot of problems, but there, there should be some caution about exaggerating um, how badly it's designed, because actually, you know, there is space for two or three buggies. It is, it is being gradually improved. It, it's getting there. And I think, you know, when you interview people, they, they like to tell you about the bad stuff. But I think, you know, slowly, slowly, it is improving. And, you know, I would sort of add that. And later on in the, in the child life cycle, we find kids really love public transport and often prefer.
referring to now certainly comes to treat. Yeah, no, I mean, this is by no means saying that the cars are perfect, and the one uh, person that I've come back to, and she drives everywhere, you know, and, and you know, she's not saying it is, it's perfect at all. Um, by any stretch, and so yes, those are, there are those ideas, but I says one of those things as well, which if you look at the evolution perhaps of the pram with the car system, is that idea of the car seat that goes straight into the mm. buggy, yes. so, so that yes. they are revolving together, yeah. and you know, about not waking your child up, about caring for your child, so there's those ideas that, that don't really work as such, so, so there are, there are yeah. differences. And maybe we could have more prams, I mean maybe the, the McLaren does, but there's, you know, pram, people don't necessarily work out to buy the pram that's best for public transport. Maybe they need to a lot of people just get them handed down and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Please. Yes, um, I agree with some of the lady there. Um, a few years ago, I, was, I worked with a council or council in terms of um, sustainable transport. Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity to speak to a lot of residents in terms of um, how to travel because some household had more than one cars and it felt like it was more convenient and they talked to they had issues, a lot of issues with um, traveling because I work for transport for London as well and um, coming from a personal view I'm a mom my child is a year old now I think I could see a bit of both because there are times where I want to take the bus and I would wait and wait and the buses are filled up uh, there are two buggies I cannot go on the transport so I'll have to go back home and take the car. Mm -hmm. And an example, if I'm dropping my kids to school, I think it's much easier to actually travel by bus. Mm -hmm. It's but because when you drive to school, you have the issues of parking. It's so congested. So, you, so I think it's just having that balance. And I think a lot of it is also perception mm -hmm. in terms of some people think public transport is an inconvenience. But like she said, in terms of the buggy, it's mm -hmm. much easier now to just stick it on. So sometimes if I'm driving to pick up my kids in school. I have the buggy in the car because my baby is too heavy for me to carry. So I bring the buggy out of my car, put the baby in, walk to school, get and then put it back. So it's really having the balance, really. But I think a lot of it is being a very changes as well. People understanding their impact mm. on the environment and then yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, you first. Go ahead. <coughs> oh, I, I was interested about what you were saying about the pram. I think it, it's um, intriguing to think about uh, the, the technology of the pram because obviously that's changed quite a bit and it seems to me from the outside that they've been getting bigger again, mm -hmm. almost back to the silver cross yeah. numbers. Yeah. And, and there was a moment when they were actually much easier to take on the, easier to fold up. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the other thing is the pram is, is, is itself a, a, a mode of transporting other things. Yeah. And one of the problems with the sling which is great, even when the baby's small, but you're often festooned with bags of, full of nappies, yeah. bottles, whatever it may be. And the pram actually is, is as much used for carrying other things as well, I mean, other stuff yeah. belonging to the, yeah. The, the, yeah. the baby. Absolutely. Um, and that, that really comes across that it's a bit of a shopping trolley okay. in, in that sense. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is, I, I did wonder how London centric this is because. Um, you, you know, a lot of the problems which you described mm. are, are absolutely, yes, um, common on public transport, but in, uh, in quite a lot of places you have fewer of those stairs and mm. uh, and it's easier to walk to places. So, I mean, that's not a criticism, it's just kind of, it would be interesting to have more, you know, greater variety. Of uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think if I try and do a follow up to this, it will be mm. looking at experiences mm. because London is, it's, you know, you can't really generalise about London. That's that's the thing. And you know, I mean, it, I, I don't think really, in some ways, you'd you'd find in a random sample of twenty, I don't think you'd ever find people who use their cars as little mm. as this sample of twenty people or didn't own cars. You know, you're not going to find that. I don't think in most most other even large cities in, in the UK. As a, as, a, as a final little tiny addition, I've just been reading a, a, a thesis about uh, women with using <coughs> wheelchairs. Their problems uh, mobility. Okay. They say exactly the same things about buses, yeah. but they're full of buggies. <laughs> they're not allowed to get on. Right, right. So I mean, it is there is a capacity, a peak time capacity yeah. problem, and they do exactly the same thing of postponing. Yeah, I'd be interested to, to get that. Yeah.
the first thing, thank you for the, uh, the year lecture. Really enjoyed that. <clears throat> the first point, um, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, Hackneys, the London Borough of Cycling. Mm. Um, what, what kind of reasons make it favourable to be cycling in that area? Is it cultural or logistical? Or um, I don't know if I can answer that one. I mean, Hackney, um, when I say it's a London Borough of Cycling, it's got about a 12, 10, 12% modal share uh, of sort of commuting, which compared to sort of 2% as London generally, and that's quite high. London is, 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 has had a cycling boom, but, you know, particularly in Hackney. Hackney's interesting because, and if you, and it's interesting because it's right next to Camden as well. Camden went all out for infrastructure and cycle paths and has not seen much of a growth. Hackney has went the opposite way and just said it was just going to take away um, some obstacles really and hasn't gone for cycling specific infrastructure and has seen much more growth. I'd actually say it was more demographic, more down to the demographic because the, the boom in cycling in London has been white, male and middle class and young as well below the age of 45. Um, and Hackney as a gentrifying borough has seen an influx of people in that kind of category, um, really, um, the gender thing is 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 less because there's there's also a, a, there's a sizable increase in women cycling in London. So, so it seems to me that it's it's kind of more due to demographics in Hackney than anything else. But um, I'm sure other people might say different. And just very briefly about the um, the French expat couple mm. values changed. Was personally be conducted before they had given birth. Yes, yeah, yeah, and the second, I mean, um, I haven't actually gone back and interviewed them there. I had a quote from their diary up there. Um, I'm not sure what you were saying had changed in yeah, their values. So well, I mean, did they give reasons why their values had changed, or are you um, extrapolating the reasons for change? No, I'm... Are you, are you sure that was the... the, the the so sort of, environmentally friendly couple. Ah, uh, no, yeah, that, that was, that's why I'm getting confused. That was, that was Laura, who just, she, she lived with her partner. She's, um, yeah, she's not a French expat. Um, yeah, it was, it was very much, I mean, she still had those pro-environmental values. She just felt that she increasingly couldn't live them. She couldn't action them, you know, because of, of the stress that, that she was having. And, you know, and, and it's always going to be different for different mothers. What comes across is that, you know, some people's babies sleep. They're not. They're not tired. They're not. They're not traumatized in the same way that other parents are. Who are finding it very hard going. So, so it's very difficult to generalize and point fingers, you know, because you know she herself. That was. That's her experience. That's where she's coming from, and she was having a very hard time um, with public transport, particularly. She was. She was so tired. Um, so yeah. Oh, thanks. Loads of interesting stuff, and um, we're doing. We're doing a very similar project to Justine. We're looking at. Also transition um, through, um, through having the first child and looking at how various aspects of day life change. So we've also got some stuff on transport in London and we've already talked about it. Um, I don't know, but lots of things to say. I think one of the things that strikes me in your data is the sort of strength of social expectations of, of what mothers need. And I think that's a really interesting thing to kind of look at. So um, rather than just looking, I think, at how, how individuals sort of individual stories of how terrible everything is and, and, and that, that being a kind of reason for needing a car, one of the things that comes across to me is just that the strength of that social, almost, you know, social sanctions on people not 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 to cycle but to have a car and to have a pram and the way that's almost kind of been forced for people. So I think that's quite striking. And the, the other thing I think is interesting is that, you know, we talked about stuff about the technology seems to do too, but it's obviously, it's like, it's like the car in a way, it's not just a mode of transporting somebody from A to B, but there's a whole lot of kind of symbolism around buggies and there's an interesting work on that, but also around slings, and Danny Miller's got that nice stuff about um, you know, mothers in North London with their slings and other people not wanting to be part of the sling brigade, so, you know, those things yeah. are not just, yeah. you know, more or less convenient ways of transporting children. Yeah, that, stuff attached to them, I think. No, I'd, I'd be interested, I think one of the offshoots from, from this, if I get the chance, will be to look at that, and I don't know if anyone's doing it, that sort of 
as Sophie said, the history of the design of the buggy, and particularly in relation to the car system, how, how if that has really evolved, are there any sort of really strong links? I think there, there are stronger links now, as I say, with those, you know, the, the seats that go straight into the buggy, those kind of things, but going back a bit further, the sort of the links there, I think that's a really important aspect to, to look at, really. Yeah. And we've got some, I mean, we have got some of those positive stories in our data about about people that sleep, you know, we've got people saying oh, it's better for it's better for the baby. So the same discourse as with the baby's comfort taking precedence, but justifying using public transport rather than using the car. So I think there's quite a lot of flexibility there. And also about I mean where we where a lot of our pit parents live is near near Clapham Junction, where there's being worked to kind of make everything on level access. So actually getting the train becomes an easy thing to do. So those kind of, that those things sort of those kind of constructions of public transport as incredibly difficult difficult do you know vary within London as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, right. One more here, please. Oh no, it's okay. You're okay, you're done. Any others? Time for one more, I think. Please, Jen. Well, yeah, very interesting. I was curious. Kate's earlier off the cuff definition of sustainable transport was local. Mm. I, one thing that seems kind of implicit in your data, I just wonder if you've got anything specific on it. I mean, moving somewhere is a hassle, so they discuss which ways they're not going to choose or they're going to choose. But do you have evidence that where they can, they choose to travel less and do more things locally? Um, what's interesting, and perhaps it's, perhaps it's a London thing, is that I think people were surprisingly local right. um, anyway, even prior to. They, they really did try and and uh, kind of, yeah, use the local markets and, you know, use the local shops. Um, but, yeah, they were, they were much more local than, than I expected um, on, a, on a weekly kind of basis, on a, on a regular basis. Um, and so in some senses it's not a surprise that, you know, I'm not really seeing that much of a change there as such. Um, I mean, if I was going to hypothesise anything, I'd, I'd expect that to be somewhat different, perhaps in a, in a more suburban sort of um, setting, where distances are obviously kind of greater. Um, but yeah, there was a real emphasis on walking where possible for kind of everyone, really. Okay. Just that's super wonderful. Yeah. You've, you've, you've now spoken for. Um, it's six to eight months, yeah. And you're going back again? No, sadly and not. You're not uh, no, I would love to. I, I've, I'm leaving it with all of them that, that was, are they happy for me yeah. to come back at the sort of two year mark, one and a half, two year mark, if I can find someone to give me some money, basically. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so far everyone's, everyone's happy to because, you know. Because I wonder whether, I, I think what I'm picking up, there might. A lot of it is because a lot, most of the mothers we speak to are actually going back to work. So everything is kind of like a temporary mm -hmm. setup, a temporary measure. Mm -hmm. So things will be reverting back to normal. I've got this big buggy because I need to go this way, but it's only for a short period of time because ultimately I'll be going back to work and it won't apply. So that's something you might not be picking up. Yeah, well, I mean, there was also always already an element of that in the fact that a lot of the mums who did cycle started cycling again. So they've picked up where they left off just not when they've got their child with them. Um, so, so there is an, a, a, a sense that things are in some ways returning to you know, normal, whatever that is. Yeah. Then you've got transport to the childcare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we better draw to a close there. Um, I think we'd love to have you back just to uh, talk through the results when you've when completed all the field work and done more analysis. I'd love to know more about the um, Fate of the ten pound prams and these. Yeah, so I'm going to die. You can sense the tension building up in that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think as well, it'd be, it'd be nice to you know, have to have some uh, event where we can we can formally put your results in dialogue with the work that's coming out. The, the illicit project, particularly about, about um, uh, the, the, the impact of the arrival of the first child. So thank you very much, Steve, for coming. Great to have you back here. Thanks very much. Thank you.